and welcome back to Afterglow. This is going to be episode 26, and we're going to be talking about another licensed game on the NES. Uh, this week we're going to be uh, talking about my memories of Batman, the very first Batman game that came out for the NES. Now, um, the NES kind of has a bad reputation when it comes to licensed games. Uh, a lot of people claim that any licensed game that uh, released on the NES was really not a good game. Now, I'll argue that uh, quite a bit. Uh, I actually argued it uh, way back whenever I did the episode on RoboCop for the NES. But I can see where people would think that it's not a good game. And that it's kind of like an acquired taste for me that I enjoy it. That being said, there are a good licensed game on the NES, and this is one of them. Now, most of those good licensed games uh, were released by a company called Sunsoft, who, um, in the NES days, they could do no wrong, in my opinion. They made some awesome games, and they kind of, like, fell out for me in the 16-bit era. I believe Sunsoft did, like, Arrow the Acrobat, which I was not a fan of, rented it, and didn't like it. But uh, Batman, this game, is one I would rent time after time after time, and honestly, easily one of my favorite NES games. But we're going to go into a deeper dive on uh, Batman for the NES after the music break. Alright, so my memories of Batman. Um, honestly, I didn't like have a whole lot of comic books I read as a kid. So my first introduction to Batman was actually the uh, Michael Keaton movie with Jack Nicholson back in, I think it was 1989. And uh, I was taken to the theater by my parents to see the movie. I, uh, 1989, let's do some math. I would have been seven years old at the time, so maybe a little young for this movie, but dear God, it left an impression. It was an awesome movie. And uh, immediately, snap fingers, I became a fan of Batman. Uh, still love Batman to this day, by the way. He don't need no superpowers. He just needs a whole lot of money. <laughs> so, um, going on, um, of course, I rented the video game. And I loved it. Uh, it gets a lot of comparisons to Ninja Gaiden. But uh, to me, they handle just a bit differently. Uh, Batman uh, doesn't have that wall stick that uh, Ryu has in Ninja Gaiden. So you have to time your button presses in order to uh, get the jump right. Otherwise, you're just going to fall. Uh, to me, it gives it a, a unique game mechanic that you don't really see in Ninja Gaiden. 
But this is one of those games that I couldn't uh, ever, like, get my own copy of. None of my friends ever got it, so I couldn't really uh, do any game swapping or trading with them. The only place that ever had it was uh, the rental stores. And, uh, of course, uh, everyone that listens to this podcast is familiar that later on I uh, would have been, like, between 14, 15, 16, that rental store began selling off a lot of their games. But um, they um, they had the game, but someone must have beat me to actually buying up their copy of it because I never saw it for sale or anything. So someone else must have snagged it. But going back, um, I had never actually beaten the game. I think whenever I had been running it, I had only gotten to the third level, which isn't horrible because the game only has five levels in it. But um, I could only get to the third level, and I really did want to uh, beat this game, but I could never find a copy of it after the NES stuff had uh, disappeared from the rental shelves and from the store shelves. So um, later on, of course, I got my computer, and uh, you know I'm talking about a computer and a console game and put them together. You know what that means in this show, right? If not, well, here's the clip. Do what you want, because a pirate is free. You are a pirate. You're a hard indeed. Being a pirate is a wretched thing. Do what you want, because a pirate is free. You are a pirate. You are a pirate. Yep, the only way I could replay this game is through emulating it through piracy, of course. And uh, I absolutely did. And even though that gave me like an infinite amount of time to practice and play this game, I could still only barely get to the fifth last level of the game. And uh, I could just barely even get there. And I got my rear end handed to me if I could make it to the final bosses. But, um... I still really, really love the game. It was a blast to play. And that's the difference between a game like this and a game like uh, one that we previously had on here, Total Recall. In this game, whenever it's really, really difficult and you die, you feel like it was your fault. And there is something that you could have done to prevent it. And you learn and try to get better next time. Whereas Total Recall, it's just always horrible controls. And there's you don't feel like there's anything you could have done. But um, I really, really love this game, but could never beat it legitimately. So finally, I gave up, and I cheated. I game genied my way through it, and did eventually beat it. And uh, one, one thing reflecting back that I want to talk about um, after I had beaten it was this is one of those games where it followed the movie fairly decently for the most part. You got the Streets of Gotham, which is like the opening of the movie. You've got the uh, Axis Labs, which Batman does go into. Uh, the cave system, not so much. And then Joker's Laboratory, that's almost like a revisit to Axis Chemical Labs. But uh, then you've got finally the uh, the church at the end. So it very, very loosely follows the movie until the end. Uh, spoiler alert for the end of the game, by the way. Uh, Batman kills the Joker. And yes, Joker does die at the end of the movie, too. But uh, in, in the game, it's not remotely like secondhand like it was in the movie. Like In the movie, the way Joker dies is that Batman catches Joker's leg with this cable gun that then wraps around a uh, gargoyle, a stone gargoyle on the building. And the weight of the stone gargoyle... Um, takes Joker off this uh, <clears throat> this ladder it's singing off this helicopter to a, a huge fall that ends up killing him. So Batman technically doesn't kill him because if that chopper wasn't trying to continually pull Joker away, if it would have landed then, or at least hovered in place for a little bit to where Joker could free himself... It wouldn't have killed him. Joker's own hubris killed him. In the game, Batman literally punches him off the roof and kills him. <laughs> it's pretty, and it's brutal because there's even like a line of text, now you'll dance with the devil in the pale moonlight right before he kills him. It's like, whoa. <laughs> uh, that being said, uh, this version of Batman is really different from uh, a lot of the comic books and a lot of the uh, cartoons because everyone knows that Batman doesn't use guns. Well, in this game, he totally uses guns. He's got, like, a literal spear gun thing that he uses to attack enemies, uh, along with a uh, dirk and a uh, battering. 
And a lot of people claim, oh, that's not like Batman to use a gun. Uh, in the movie, he uses guns. Uh, it's not as uh, forward as it is in the game, but if you remember, he had the Batwing, and he had the two machine guns that popped up with the uh, rockets also firing at Joker, trying to shoot him. <laughs> so uh, he uses guns in the movie as well. But uh, going back into the game, uh, Batman's default weapon is his fists, uh, which, of course, it's Batman. <laughs> uh, he uses his punch, but the range is horrible. The damage is okay, but you have to use the special weapons in this game. Uh, the battering is usually your go-to, in my opinion, because it doesn't use a lot of the ammunition, and uh, it fires out pretty quick. It doesn't have much more range than the punch, but maybe twice as much as the punch. But uh, it comes in so handy just to have that extra range. Uh, the Dirk takes the most ammunition, but it uh, almost fires a triple shot across the screen. And then the Spear Gun is just one shot that goes all the way across the screen, whereas that Battering only goes like maybe two or three times as much as that Punch and returns back. But you've got to manage your ammunition in this game because you can find yourself in some really tricky spots if you're stuck with only your Punch with certain enemies. Like, there's this hopper enemy in the cave area. That's the best way I can describe him. And he will, like, whenever he goes on screen, he'll literally just jump on top of you repeatedly and take you out so fast. Uh, there's also these, like, big tank-like enemies. And again, uh, unless you can get up on them and then duck down under them, they, they'll just light you up. <laughs> But overall, it's a really fun game. I did eventually buy a copy of it uh, whenever I started game collecting in my uh, mid and early 20s. But it took forever to actually find a copy uh, because I never found one. Like, you know, no rental shop that was selling it, uh, no Goodwills or yard sales. This is one that I had to go on eBay and buy. And I'm glad I did because, again, I really, really love this game. It's a definite proof that you can make a movie-based game that's good, and that the NES does have some. And there is more than this one. We'll talk about others down the road. I've actually been playing two of them. Both of them from Sunsoft. This is the first one. Uh, we'll talk about the other one in another episode of Afterglow down the road. But I'm going to go ahead and close this episode out there. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to kick back and listen to my ranting and my memories on some old video games. So, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Hope you enjoy the music outro. And we'll see you on the next episode of Afterglow.